Good morning, this is Dr. Kornman. This is a lecture on how to identify and treat lumbar spinal disorders. This information is more geared toward the physician, the therapist, the chiropractor than it is the layman, but the layman can understand the terms if they spend time to look at the website and to interpret some of the more clinical terms. The key to rehabilitation is to start to think of how the various spinal structures function and how they can fail. Then you can think of how this failure will manifest as symptoms. And finally, then you can understand how different loading positions of the spine will affect these structures to understand how to reverse or ameliorate this disorder. As we discussed the lumbar th spine, you have to look at the spinal structure's function and how they can fail. This is, uh-oh, did I lose it? No, there we go. Then how you think of this failure will manifest as symptoms. And then finally, understand how different loading positions will affect the structures to understand how to reverse and ameliorate the disorder. Every disorder has certain positions that generally cause pain and positions that ameliorate the pain. If you understand the disorder, you can reverse or at least ameliorate it. So, we'll talk today about anatomy, physiology, function, alignment, pain generators, biomechanics, degeneration injury, and treatment of protocols. Yes, in 45 minutes. So, spinal function. The spine is an interesting structure. You have to, oh goodness, okay. You have to have enough flexibility to allow positioning of the head and neck and shoulders in position for daily activities. If you're going to tie your shoe, if you're going to pull a roast out of the oven. The spine also houses the neurologic structures, so it has to have strong resistance to excess motion that could damage the cord and the nerves, obviously. And the ligaments and discs are passive resistors and dampeners of motion. Does this have a laser pointer to it, my chin? No, it doesn't. Uh-oh, did I turn it off? Okay, let's, let's go back. So, let's just simply overview the spine. We have five lumbar vertebra. The discs are sandwiched in between anteriorly. So if you look, right, let's see if it'll work here, yeah. If you look, these are the shock absorbers, right? You have an alignment, and the front to back view of the spine is nice and straight. And on the side, you have a curve, and the curve is due to the trapezoidal nature of the discs. If I took all those discs and piled a vertebra one on top of another, you'd have a column, it wouldn't have a curve. So, the facets in back, are important because they are railroad tracks. They guide the motion of the spine in only certain directions. The spinal canal is the back of the spine that's important because of the center of rotation we'll talk about, and the nerve roots exit here. So alignment is an important deal. The alignment means that you keep the head straight over the pelvis. That's important because so many people come to my office out of alignment. Why is that important? Because if your head is not centered perfectly over your pelvis, let's say it's in the front by three inches, what do you have to do? Well, how do you compensate? Well, you bend or muscle contraction, right? So people who have an imbalance in the spine will have to contract the muscles and they'll come into you with a complaint of muscle. What happens to muscles when they contract too long? burning pain in the paravertebral muscles. You hear this all the time. So the question is, you're trying to diagnose the disorder, what's wrong? Is your alignment off? Are you overactivating the paravertebrals because you're forward? This is part of a diagnosis. So this, out of all the slides today, is the most important slide and the reason why I'm so busy. This has to do with the disc. When we're a little worm on our mom's belly, we literally look like a planaria worm and we start to infold. That's the neural canal. You have the notochord in the back and then you have these little somites on either side. These somites are the muscle, the nerve, and the notochord, the primitive notochord, turns into the nucleus of the disc. It's sort of interesting. That's our segments and that's where we join. So the vascularity of the disc diminishes. It's the largest mass of avascular tissue in the body. This is a stain for blood vessels in a three-year-old. God knows how we got it. But you can look at the disc. This is the sacrum. This is L5. You can see the cartilage here. 
You can see the blood vessels in the disc, and the blood vessels do not penetrate at three years of age, do not penetrate into the disc space. The disc is avascular at the age of three. So what do we do? What happens because we have no blood supply? That's pretty important, wouldn't you think? So what happens to the spine? With aging, the collagen changes, and the nucleus loses its jelly. Everybody knows the jelly-filled donut story of the disc, right? Or a car tire full of jello. It's really what it is. So you have no blood supply. So we've done tests and found that the oxygen concentration right here is 30 times greater than it is here. What happens to the cells in the center of the disc without oxygen? They malfunction and die. We've actually done experiments, taking those cells out, putting them on cold, uh, agar with oxygen, and they start functioning again. So the cells die because of lack of oxygen. This means you're all in here degenerates. Sorry, you don't have a choice, you're all degenerates. So as the disc degenerates, you start to get bone spurs and you get tears in the disc. This is inevitable in most people. The facets also degenerate. The facets are regular joints like hip, knees, elbows, and shoulders, and there's more in the spine than the rest of the body combined which makes my fellow surgeons over at the clinic look sort of small. I have more joints in my area than they have. So, so what happens to the joints? Well, the cartilage, the cartilage breaks down. The cartilage is like a Teflon surface. You start to fibrillate or fracture this cartilage. You can break pieces off. And you start to get bone spurs. And these bone spurs can grow into areas and cause trouble by themselves. In addition, I said the facets can erode and they're the door stops, meaning that one vertebra above hooks into the back of the vertebra below. You wear that door stop out, and what's going to happen to that vertebra? It's going to start to slide forward, right? OK. So now we're starting to put together what can happen to the spine. So now you start to think of how you can reverse this. So how do we know what causes pain? Well, there's some fascinating studies. This is in the 60s, Smith and Wright out of Britain. What they would do, they would do a spine surgery, and literally they would loop a nylon suture around different structures in the spine, suture the incision closed, have these things sticking out with labels on them, nerve, disc, dura, God knows how, but they were able to get away with this, and they gave us valuable information. So a normal nerve root, God knows why they put a suture on a normal, normal nerve root, but they did. So you tense a normal nerve root, there's no pain. A normal nerve root doesn't trigger. Okay, interspinous ligament and ligamentum flavum, parts of the back ligaments of the spine, no pain. Dura matter, God knows how they put this around dura matter, but they did, and there was no pain. And then here, very important, the greater the pressure to a compromised nerve root, the greater the length of radiated pain. So those guys who know McKenzie extension exercises, he talks about centralization. This has to do with curing a nerve root. A nerve root that's red hot will radiate, let's say you have S1, it goes to the bottom of the foot. A nerve, that pain that goes to the bottom of the foot, that's S1. But if S1 is only mildly irritated, it's only buttocks pain. I can't tell you how many times somebody comes in my office told it's a sacroiliac syndrome, it's a piriformis syndrome. It's not, it's a nerve problem 99% of the time. So another study, this one by Kuslich. This guy did microdiscectomies on awake patients. What he would do, give them sedation, and then he would stimulate a structure and then numb it with lidocaine, incise the structure, go down to the next structure, stimulate it, see what kind of pain was generated, and then continue the surgery. And he found very similar findings. Normal, sorry, normal nerve root, insensitive to pain. Sciatic, stimulation of a swollen nerve root. So a nerve root has to be swollen in order to be painful. Buttocks pain. I'm almost getting it here. Uh, stimulation of annulus and nerve root. I won't bother you with that. Capsule, meaning the joint capsule, generally no pain. And muscle, sharp pain with forcible stretching only. So you get a feel for what causes pain, right? One last thing they didn't do is talk about bone pain. So, oh my goodness. There we go. OK, so here's a spine. You can see normal discs here, and obviously this one isn't too normal. You see the nice normal bone surfaces here. You see the fractures. You see the white in the bone here that you don't see up here. This is disc failure. It's called isolated disc resorption. Actually pretty common in our population. 
And this is bone pain. And there's two things. There's the deep, dull ache when you start to load the spine, and then there's the delayed onset pain. You ask, I call it pay for it later pain. People will do an activity, it hurts at the time, and then six hours later they're miserable. That's because of the inflammatory cascade. We won't spend much time on that, but this gives you an idea of what causes pain. So why don't people come into my office and say, Doc, my left L3-4 facet, I'm sure I pulled the capsule. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. They come in and say, I've got back pain. And this de describes it perfectly. This is Frank Netter's great picture done 50 years ago. This is called the homunculus. This is the brain. These are the inner and outer cortices. And this shows you how much area is devoted to what part. So for example, if you look here at the tongue, the tongue has three times as much surface area devoted to it than the entire lumbar spine does. So this is why you can't tell me why your back hurts or where it hurts, because you're not wired to know. You just know it hurts, but you don't have the neurons to specifically say this is my left L2-3 disc. So just to let you know, this is why you can't identify things well. That's. So now we're going to talk about functional biomechanics. This allows you to understand the changes in the spine with position, motion, and loading. This means you don't have to memorize a treatment protocol if you know the disorder. If you start to think of the why, you'll start to understand the how. So you can intrinsically understand the biomechanics of a spine disorder and then design a treatment program. And this is the driest but most important part of the lecture. So keep the pins in your eyeballs so you can keep awake. So what happens to loading of the spine in different positions? Well, in the neutral lumbar spine, the discs are loaded 70% and the facets are 30. You start to put that together. What happens with back pain? Do you overload or underload the discs? How do you change the loading pattern so you reduce the pain? Flexion loads the discs 100% and extension loads the facets 60 to 70%. So now you have a little piece of information you can start to put into a training program to try and ameliorate some of the pain. Everybody's talking about lumbopelvic rhythm today. And a lumbopelvic rhythm, there's a normal rhythm just like the scapulothoracic rhythm. When you start to bend forward, the first thing that bends is your lumbar spine. And then once you've reached your maximum flexion, then you start to bend, <laughs> oh goodness, here you start to bend through the pelvis. And so the normal lumbar rhythm is you bend your lumbar spine first and then you flex through the pelvis. Your job today is to try and reverse that if you have a spinal disorder. And that's because of this. Position effects on intradiscal pressures. Back in the 60s, Alf Nockhamson convinced about 40 medical students to let him put a needle into their lumbar spine L3-4 disc and then measure the pressure. Medical students do anything for money. So <laughs> this is what they did. And this is a great teaching graph because you'll see when you're lying on your Sorry, this is not working. When you're lying on your side, on your back and on your side, the pressures are lower. As you stand up, the pressure reaches 100. As you start to bend forward, look at that. Just bending forward, 150 pressure, bending forward with the weight 220, but jump up to the last one at 275 when you're flexed and loading. The more you have flexion in your hips, the more you load your disc. So let's go to the thing that everybody hates, physics. What are we doing? We're trying to figure out how much stress is on a joint. And I wish this worked, but that's OK. Um, if you look, your fulcrum point is right over your sacrum, right? That's your fulcrum point. As you bend forward, you're putting more and more pressure on the sacrum. And the further you reach out, the greater that lever arm is. And what happens is you start to overload the sacrum. And it's very similar to this. You remember the old lever arm with the fulcrum? So you're nicely balanced. Here are your back muscles here. And if the fulcrum is long and you have a nice long muscle, oh, thank you. Does that work? Oh, perfect. So you can see the back muscles aren't stressed. You're lifting close to the center of your gravity. When you lift away from your center of gravity, you're increasing the lever arm, and you're increasing the stress on your back muscles. So there are certain positions on the back that do much better than other positions. You have to learn this. This is what Bill's talking about. How do you change set habit patterns? I'm going to move this mic from here to here. So what am I going to do? Normally, bend forward, lift, push it, put it over there. How
haven't moved my feet at all, have I? That's our learned pattern. But a learned pattern is wrong because once your spine becomes a little less stable, you have more problems. You have to learn to move your feet, and we'll talk about how to do that. So everybody talks about multifidi muscles. Multifidi, that's not all I hear about. So I want to let you know this is an MRI of the spine muscles, and you can see the multifidi here and the erector spiny here, OK? The principal action of the multifidi is to extend the spine, but they really don't work well unless they're locked. This is the key with lumbopelvic rhythm. The multifidi muscles don't have a lot of lever arm ability. They're not very strong. The extensors, the erector spiny are, but you'll notice that these erector spiny do not insert into the vertebra. Only the multifidi do. So the erector spiny don't control the lumbar spine. They just control extension. So now we go back to physics again, and this is the most important picture here. You'll see that when you bend forward, lifting a 90 kilogram or 200 pound weight, flex forward, this is your biomechanical diagram. Here's your sacral flexion point, here's your torso load, here's your load of newtons from the weight, and this is the resultant force, look at that, in the lumbar spine, 9,200 newtons. For a newton is a, a physiologic uh, energy measurement. And that's a huge force. And you have to understand what is resisting that force. It's your discs and your ligaments, right? So look at the mechanical disadvantage. Now, look at your thumb, OK? That muscle in your thumb, that short muscle, that is the same size as a multifidi muscle. That's what you have. You've got one at each level on each side, but that's it. So a study indicated that multifidi muscles as a whole could generate 60 newtons of extension force. But you need 8,200. 8, so your multifidi muscles are outgunned. It's important that they work, but if you put them in a mechanical disadvantage, you're going to screw up your spine. This shows you what happens when discs degenerate. This was a study where they put a, a normal newton load force on a disc, and they measured from normal discs to grade 3 degeneration. So look, this is how much displacement and this is time. As Bill was talking about creep, discs will creep over time. A normal disc, here's a non-degenerative grade zero disc, doesn't displace immediately, but over time will displace a little bit. But look at the typical degenerative disc, immediately displaces over a short period of time and then displaces much more. So if you've got a degenerative disc, you've got an inherent problem in your spine you, you can't compensate for normally by strengthening muscles, what you have to do is learn to lift, bend, and twist in a proper fashion. And this is the reason why. The disc itself is, as I said, a jelly-filled donut. You have the jelly or the nucleus on the inside, and all of these fibers, there's 30 layers of lamina, these are the annular fibers, and they vary, each, each lamina goes in a different direction. So 30 degrees on this one, you go to the next layer down, it goes 30 degrees in the opposite direction. So when you rotate, what happens? You just think about it because make a connection here. This is important. When you rotate, you lose 50% of the strength of your disc. So no matter who you are or what you are, when you rotate, you lose 50% of the strength of your disc. Then you bend forward. When you bend forward, you see here the tensile fibers in the back of the disc versus in the front. The front are under compressive stress, the back are under tensile stress. This is the perfect position for an annular tear. So I like to use the term BLT because it's easy to remember. What's the evil position? I try and train all my patients to think of this. Bend, lift, twist. Bend, lift, twist. Do not do all of them at once. Try not to do two of them at once. So if you prevent rotation of the spine, as Bill says, you get out of position you're in a mechanical disadvantage. So if you're square, you already have gained 50% further strength. If you're square, if you rotate through your spine, you lose 50% of the strength. That's one of the keys to trying to get core strength. Let's continue. What happens with flexion and extension to the nerve hole? So the nerve comes out and back, right? So when you flex forward, what happens to the nerve hole? Say it opens. Thanks, OK. Now, what happens when you bend backward? Ha ha! So, if somebody comes into your office and they have leg pain, 
and they don't like standing up, but they like bending forward, you've just made a connection. They may have foraminal stenosis or lateral recess stenosis. This is how you make a diagnosis. Okay, what happens to the spinal canal when you bend forward versus when you bend backward? This is closed, closed, good. And this is, thank you. Okay, so if somebody has a narrowed spinal canal and they stand up and they get buttocks and leg pain, something called neurogenic claudication, and then it feels better, they say I can walk for 10 minutes, my legs are on fire, I bend forward or I sit down, I feel better. You have a diagnosis almost just by asking some simple questions. So let's review what these flexion spinal effects do. So flexion loads the disc. So start to put things together. If you've got back pain, you bend forward and you lift and you load the disc and it hurts more, what's the problem? Degenerative disc disease, annular tear, probably. Okay, it tensions the posterior annulus, meaning the back part of here, that's the part that tears and hurts. So does that mean that flexion will increase the load and potentially cause a tear? Yes. Flexion increases the shear forces to the lower vertebra. So the more you bend forward, the more gravity wants to shear that. If there is a deficiency, an instability, it's going to hurt. So patients that get into a certain position and have a catch, what's called an instability catch, you can start to put this together. Flexion stretches the sciatic nerve. If you've got a disc herniation here and you bend forward, you get buttocks and leg pain. Aha. But flexion, here, go back here, relaxes the femoral nerve. So if you've got a higher disc herniation and you bend forward and you feel better, your leg pain in the front of the thigh goes away, aha, you start to make connections. That's the key. Flexion relaxes the femoral nerve and reduce, reduces lordosis. Okay, let's look at what extension does. So extension narrows the central canal, the lateral recess, and the foramen. Those are all structures in the spinal canal. So if you extend, meaning just simply stand up, and you get buttocks and thigh pain, or anterior thigh pain, start to think of a nerve being compressed in the spinal canal. Extension loads the facets. People with bad facet disease, ischemic spondylolisthesis, all those, will have pain. So if you extend and you start to develop pain in the back, you start to think what other structures can be affected. Again, it tensions the femoral nerve, relaxes the sciatic nerve, unloads the disc. I won't bother you with the rest of this here. So. Traditional rehabilitation. My talk today is to challenge the therapists in the room to start thinking in terms of biomechanics and not in terms of algorithms. So what are the normal tools that we have, right? So we have stretching, we have strengthening, we have conditioning, ergonomics, activity avoidance, balance training, bracing, equipment modifications, medications, I'm not supposed to say that, but I will anyways, and positional sports changes. Some people are built differently than others. I have a thoracic hyperkyphosis. I am built to be a surgeon, right? I can sit, it's easy. I'm also built to be a skier, I'm built to be a cyclist. If I was a, I hate swimming because I have to extend my spine, get my head out of the water, it's too much work. I'm not built to be a swimmer. Sometimes you have to find the natural abilities of the patient who's trying to be a sports person and find out how they fit with their natural build. So, therapists generally do something called functional assessment. What they do, since there's no diagnostic tool, but I'm hoping to change that, they use functional assessment, is grounded in finding a cause and effect relationship between positions the patient assumes while st sitting, standing, or moving. So, what does it hurt? Does it hurt down the leg when you stand? Does it feel better when you bend forward? It's a functional assessment. So, these techniques can be very effective. I mean, they've been tried and true for years and years. McKenzie, Williams, all these other people talked about it. But the why of treatment is missing. And I'm trying to give you the why of treatment so you understand the mechanics. It's not a rote training that you've had. Start to think in terms of diagnostic techniques. So if you don't know the why, it can lead to misunderstandings and errors in the technique of real rehabilitation. This can lead to flare-ups and patient dissatisfaction. It's not uncommon for somebody to come into my office on the third or fourth visit and they're flared up and they're sort of pissed off at their therapist and the therapist is doing their best, but it's because the why sometimes is missing. The one thing I wanna say is don't over rehabilitate. You know, a shot putter like this who has never bridged and now has pain shouldn't be asked to bridge now unless you've gotten them past the point where their pain is gone and now you can start to push them. So. 
the traditional therapy philosophies, Williams flexion exercises, to stand erect humans, he said, severely deform the vertebral column, redistributing body weight to the posterior aspect of the intervertebral discs in the lumbar spine, and he said, there's ways to perform exercises and adhere to postural principles, which serve to decrease the lumbar lordosis to a minimum. And he is right half the time. McKenzie. McKenzie is a therapist. He had a person he accidentally left on the table in hyperextension. Leg pain went away. He said, aha, I've got something. So he suggested that all spinal pain can be attributed to alterations of the position of the disc's nucleus pulposus talks about soft tissue training, and the McKenzie method is to centralize back pain or leg pain. Remember what we talked about? The less a nerve is inflamed, the more it centralizes. That's really what he's doing, but he's dealing with nerves. Is he right? He's right half the time. Maitland. Maitland is really a fancy chiropractic term. In, in reality, the Maitland manipulation is really chiropractic manipulation, and we won't go through all the red flags for that. But if you use any of these philosophies by themselves, McKenzie extension exercises will aggravate stenosis, ismic spondies, facet syndrome, degenerative spondies, and femoral neuropathy. If you don't understand these diagnoses, I apologize, but I don't have time to go through them all. Flexion exercises aggravates degenerative disc disease, herniations, radiculopathy, femoral nerve. Maitland's will aggravate instability, degenerative scoli, degenerative disc. So, don't use a philosophy, use a diagnosis. If you have a diagnosis, then you can make an appropriate treatment plan. So what are the general principles of treatment? Weak core muscles are the biggest problem. Dunlop syndrome, you guys know what that is, right? The belly Dunlops over the belt? Okay, so Dunlop syndrome, abdominal wall weakness, the diaphragm descends, you get an increased lordosis, you get more stress in the spine. So there's a lack of load sharing, increased pressure on the discs and facets. That's not good. So what does the core strength do? This, in a nutshell, is it. It's a water balloon wrapped by a snake. You tighten the water balloon snake, right? What happens? You push the balloon up and down. This really is what core strengthening does. So core strengthening increases the abdominal pressure, pushes out the diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm, Load shares, reduces the pressure in the belly, I mean, reduces the pressure in the spine because you're load sharing with the lumbar spine and you reduce the, dis you create distraction and reduce the lordosis. It's a big deal. So core engagement is one of the biggest things for therapy no matter what the problem is. Lumbopelvic rhythm, remember we said normal people bend first in the lumbar spine, then they bend at the hips. You have to train people to reverse that. So make them lock their lumbar spine in some extension, as Bill talks about neutral spine, and have them flex through the hips first, and then finally let the lumbar spine go. <coughs> and the reason is there's a shear point. If you can extend your lumbar spine and hold it as you bend forward, you're past the shear point, and then you can let your lumbar spine bend. If you learn how to do this, you reduce the shear of the lumbar spine. And there are specific spine protocols for different disorders. There's the neutral spine program. These are people with instability. No matter what position you put them in, they're gonna hurt because the spine shifts. So you have to keep the spine balanced and avoid shear loads. And for example here, right, this person you can see the spinal canal, and that spinal canal is narrowed right there. What happens when they stand up? Pain. Pain but pain, nerve pain, right? They bend forward, they like that. So this is the person you want to have them flatten their back. Train them to internally rotate or to posteriorly rotate their pelvis, flatten their lumbar spine, increase, increase glute strength and core strength, and you're gonna open the canal and they can walk further. So this is a plan to take somebody with a defective problem and make them better. You can do an extension protocol. Somebody here with a really bad disc, he loads his disc. What did we learn from the biomechanics today about extension? Yes, it loads the facets and unloads the discs. So if somebody's got back pain, 
you want to extend them. You want to load the facets, which feel good. In fact, in the office, you can just ask them, you know, with back pain, extend them backwards. And a lot of patients will say, I feel better. Because you're loading the facets, you're not loading the discs. So you have to teach them how to hyperextend their spine. And what's interesting is these are the patients that do well with seat back cushions. You put one of those round rolls right in their lumbar spine, you force them to extend, you reduce their pain. So you can use these kinds of techniques to make the spine more pliable. So I don't know if I have enough time to go through this. And this is really a thumbnail sketch. But if you guys want me to, I'll try and quickly run through this. This is, you want, you want to? OK. So this is important. You can now use your biomechanical knowledge to think through a disorder. Understand the mechanics of a disorder. And this is my favorite phrase in all of medicine. William Mossler, guy who came from England or Canada, he, uh, he was Sir William Osler because everybody loved him. He, this is my favorite quote. You find what you know and you see what you look for. You have got to study the spine. You've got to learn everything you can about the spine because something is going to show up that you have read about but never seen and you'll be able to identify it. I had a patient come in the other day and he told me, I turn my head to the side, doc, I get a little nauseous and dizzy. Okay? If you don't think about it, you don't understand it. The vertebral artery goes up the back of the neck through the spine, and when he rotated to the right, he actually cut off his vertebral artery in one side and got dizzy and nauseous. So he didn't rotate his head to the side. If you don't think about what's going on with the vestibular mechanism and circulation, you won't pick it up. So all these little nuances are important to learn. It's a pain in the rear, then there's a ton of them, but if you really want to be a great spine therapist, you have to know what these are. So my favorite phrase here. So how do you do this? How do you figure out what's what? My favorite is the pain diagram. Have the patient fill out where it hurts. Now, many patients don't understand, and they'll fill out areas. They say, it's really, doc, it's my back that's hurting. And they'll point right down here, OK? That's not the back. But it's common. I mean, this is common. It's not the back. It's the glute. Or somebody say, my hip's hurting. They'll point right here. Of course it's not the hip. It's the sacroiliac joint. Is it the sacroiliac joint? from what we've said today in general? No. Most of the time, it's, it's a nerve root that's radiating pain in there. It can be other things, but these are things you pick up. If you have this, you can really determine what's going on. And you have to be able to differentiate all these because all of these have a differential diagnosis. So groin pain, differential diagnosis of groin pain is hip, right? Can be. L1 or L2 nerve. It can be a problem with the greater trochanteric bursa. There's a whole bunch of different things. So you have to start to think, OK, these are the pains. What's my differential diagnosis going to be? You have to ask them what aggravates it, right? We know already flexion extension. You've already routed out a number of things. Somebody flexes forward, has back pain. Number one, differential is, is what? Well, no, because you're flexing forward. You're unloading the facets. You're loading the discs. Degenerative disc disease, annular tear, the number one thing. So you can actually start a differential diagnosis and make lists and then try and test for it. Ballistic motions, what happens with sneezing and coughing, sleeping, flexion and extension sports. So you can start to think in your mind's eye what these things mean. That's, this is what a differential diagnosis is. Time of day, is there weakness, impact activities, activity relationships. Okay, and then you can look at a person, and sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. She can tell me all day long what her problem is, but you can look at her, and what do you see? Posture, but break it down even more. She, her head, look at her head, plumb line of the head. Head is in front of the pelvis, right? What is she doing to stand up? She's bending her knees. If I straighten her knees, what would happen to her, right? Straighten her knees. OK, so she's compensating. You can learn a ton if you understand the biomechanical faults. And you have to go through all this mental status, alignment, gait, neuro exam, vascular exam, motor strength, range of motion, pain behaviors. Great story for a vascular exam. I had a guy come into my office, a professional, said, ah, I've got this terrible right L5 radiculopathy. Terrible. I know it. I have an MRI to prove it. Puts the MRI up, certainly a small herniation, right L5S1. 
yep, I've got it, I straighten my leg, it hurts like crazy, it hurts every time I walk on it. If you don't do the full exam, you're gonna miss things. This guy, we did a palpation of his dorsalis pedis pulse, and it wasn't there. So what mimics other things? He had a vascular clot to the artery going down his leg. I mean, this was a surgical emergency. But if you don't do the test, he came in convincing everybody that he had a radiculopathy. He had the MRI to prove it, and he was a doc, so you trust him. Don't trust anybody, I hate to say it. You have to do a complete physical examination to figure out what's going on, but you have to know the results of those physical examinations to know what to do. So, I am a big advocate of therapists, everybody, even trainers, looking at x-rays. And this, unfortunately, there's no one course yet to train about x-ray, but x-rays just about everybody has who has back pain. They'll come in from a chiropractor or a therapist or they'll come in from a family doc and everybody gets x-rays, but nobody knows how to interpret them. And they are the single most valuable tool you have other than an MRI, which many people won't have. And you can learn about degenerative disc disease, IDR, isolated disc resorption, these kinds, all of these things you can learn about. You can't learn about stenosis, H&P, or something called pars fractures, but if you have enough knowledge, you can figure out what these things are. And I won't bore you with this. So the bottom line here is appropriate rehabilitation. Take a thorough history, know what you are looking for, so you know, need to know the disorders that can occur. You need to know how to do a good physical examination and know the differential findings. Be able to have a rudimentary understanding of imaging. Look at all the images available. Even if you don't read MRIs, look at MRIs. I've got on my website videos explaining how to understand MRIs. Put this together. Start to put this together so that you can take these patients and really help to diagnose them. And then finally, you can design a treatment protocol that matches the disorder. You don't have to do a Maitland. You don't have to do a McKinsey or a Williams flexion exercise. You can design a, a rehab program to fit the person to make them better. And questions. Any questions? Okay. Thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit about the Aspen Sports Summit. There is CEU credits given to fitness professionals. So whether you're a ski coach working with kids, you're a physical therapist, or you're a fitness instructor, you can become better at what you do and give back more to the community. Uh, thank you again to the sponsors, speakers, people who come from all over, attendees, and all the volunteers. You guys rock. I could not put this on without the help of all the volunteers. It takes a community to put on a, a conference like this and to grow it, so thank you so much, all of you. Thank you for participating, thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again next year at our second annual Aspen Sports Summit.